Felina Mekialoha, mahalo for joining us today for the fourth episode of the Consortium of Asian American Theaters and Artists Confess virtual series entitled Return to the Source. I'm Haile Opua Baker from Kapa'a Kauai. I'm a board member of Kata and one of the co-chairs of the seventh national Asian American Theater Conference and Festival, which will be held here in Hawaii at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Before introducing today's episode, I wanted to congratulate President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. As an indigenous artist of color, having a woman of color in a leadership position in the White House is a beacon of hope and light for our future. This is a time for change, a time to recognize the injustices and inequities of the past, a time to reform, a time to restore a new equilibrium for all people. And this shift is also an opportunity to create an administration that reflects the diversity of America. It's time to brown up the White House. My aloha is with President-elect Biden and Vice President-elect Harris as they prepare for transitioning America into a space of hope, kindness, empathy, inclusion, and truth for a thriving tomorrow. Mahalo in advance for your endurance and commitment to repair the country. And we all understand that there is a lot of work to be done. We are hopeful that the new administration will support artists and restore the country's vitality. Return to the source. This series was designed to bridge conversations with theater artists of color, ground us in our artistry and foster community collaboration via this virtual platform. These monthly gatherings encourage discussion around relevant topics and issues that we're facing during these uncertain times of the global pandemic. Like in September with the conversation around modeling solidarity and, the, and using theater as political action, as well as the episode in October that focused on artists on the front lines and their creativity and the changes that we are facing during COVID-19. We truly hope that this virtual series grounds our monthly conversations in the theme for the upcoming CONFEST, which is Ku'u Aina, Ku'u Piko, Ku'u Kahua, our beloved land, navel, and foundation, which serve as inspiration for everything we do here in Hawaii. Being as we have all come from the land, our umbilical cord reaches to it, stringing together the multitudes of generations that are our foundation. This reciprocal relationship of Aina, Pico, and Kahua enable us to reconnect to the source. The source is our Aina, the source is our Pico, the source is our kahua. In recognizing each of these things, we are able to commune with the divine inspiration that is our source. And now I want to introduce our host for today's conversation, founding Kata board member and the artistic director of Art to Action, Andrea Asif. Andrea is a writer, performer, director, and cultural organizer. And we are ecstatic about the panel and performances that Andrea has curated for us here today. Nomadic imagination, transnational homelands, and cultural return. Our fourth episode of Return to the Source. Aloha e Andrea. Aloha so much, Haile, for that beautiful introduction and grounding. I'm so excited and honored to be the host for this um, as a Katsu 
Denver. And uh, I cannot wait for us to be able to gather when it is safe to do so again in Hawaii with you and all of the wonderful artists that we will get to meet there. Um, so I am honored to be able to bring this vote to you and be part of this series with all the wonderful tonight. Thank you so highly for welcoming us. Um, as Haile said, I am Andrea Asaf. Uh, I'm calling, oh, thank you, mahalo. Calling in from Tampa, Florida, which is of the Seminole. And we'll say good night uh, and thank you to Haile. Uh, she will certainly be back for future episodes. Um, so tonight's, uh, tonight's episode is the fourth episode. Um, and our themes are this idea of nomadic imagination, transnational homelands, and cultural return. Um, I am a, a, a longtime board member of Kata, and Kata has played a, a key role in uh, being a host and a convening space for artists who are of um, Manasa or uh, Middle Eastern, North African, South Asian descent and artists who are, um, uh, we, we identify under so many different uh, terms and umbrellas in our very, very complex community from Southwest Asia to Central Asia um, to our relationship to South Asia. And Kata has been a space that has welcomed the umbrella of all of our identities and has hosted uh, in 2016, a pre-conference um, for Southwest and Central Asian American artists that was one of several gatherings um, that has led to the evolution of a new organization or a new national coalition called uh, Minatma or the Middle East North African uh, Theater Makers Alliance. Um, and so uh, Kata and Minatma have a long-standing a relationship that we hope to build on with this episode and in the future. Um, so this event tonight will include scenes from uh, artists who were selected for the 2020 Confest that was to be in Hawaii and of course had to be postponed due to the pandemic. Um, but we will get to see uh, selections of work by the festival artists, by two of the festival artists tonight. Um, and along with a panel discussion by additional invited guests. Um, so the videos we will see tonight include excerpts from Ada, Questions from My Father, a new musical with book music lyrics by New York Musical Festival award-winning theater artist Aya Aziz, directed by Arpita Mukherjee of Hypocrite Theater Company. Um, so we will get to see uh, uh, an excerpt of that production, which I'm very excited about. And you'll get to meet both Aya and um, Arpita in our, in our panel discussion. And we'll also see uh, a, a video about a piece called The Red Shador that has many, many iterations by performance artist Anita Yu Ali, who is a Muslim American artist um, not in from the MENA uh, part of the world, but we wanted to um, be have a very inclusive conversation, um, recognizing that in this time period we've all been lived through, Islamophobia and its many manifestations affects all of us, regardless of our religious identity or affiliation, and in that way has impacted uh, artists and communities from uh, our communities here in the United States to um, North Africa and Southwest Asia and Central Asia, as we call the Middle East, to South Asia and all the way to Southeast Asia and all across the Asian continent, as well as here in the Americas. Um, and so for this conversation, we will look at both works of art and see how they contribute uh, to our thinking about this idea of nomadic imagination and uh, transnational homelands and cultural return. Um, and we'll be joined after we see some artwork uh, by a wonderful, exciting panel, uh, which I will tell you about in just a moment, that includes Arpita Mukherjee, who directed Ada, Heather Raffo, 
Iraqi American playwright and actress, and Khaloud Sawaf, who is a theater director from Syria, now living in Arkansas in the United States. And in addition to these fantastic panelists who you'll meet later, we will also have a special video message that I think of as both a rumination on tonight's themes as well as a provocation from Jamil Khoury, who is the artistic director of Silk Road Rising and also a Katza board member. So uh, W.E.B. E. Du Bois often said, begin with art because art tries to take us outside of ourselves. It is a matter of trying to create an atmosphere and a context so conversation can flow back and forth and we can be influenced with each other. So we are going to start with art. And I'd like you to please welcome Aya Aziz, who will introduce an excerpt of her play, Aida, Questions for My Father. Hello, Aya. Welcome. You might be muted, Aya. I'm so muted. We'll there you oh, are. There you are. Oh. Hello, it's such an honor to be here. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity and for such a timely conversation. Um, I, so this, this clip you're going to see, um, it, uh, Questions for My Father is a semi-autobiographical story um, about uh, a family kind of split across continents and um, cultural expectations uh, and dreams. Um, and the clip that you're going to see um, is, I think, begins with a satirization of uh, the Orient um, and we <laughs> we thought it would be um, enjoyable to open to open the show um, with kind of the I don't know if folks have seen many adaptations of like that I, I've seen so many adaptations of one what one thousand and one nights that have inspired this song in me and just like in general and honestly you know my own understanding of of the east the far east you know growing up as a as a kid and 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 kind of longing for this world and getting it through um, the novels that I read as a as a young person, and so you'll see um, a satirization a satirization of that, um, and then it I think the clip will move into uh, the story. So yeah, I, I look forward to the discussion after after this. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your work. Let's see it. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
university, the Arab world erupted in mass protest. First in Tunis, then Egypt, Oman, Yemen, Syria, Morocco, until 13 nations were suddenly alive with revolution. On January 28th, army tanks rolled into the streets of Cairo. I saw it secondhand, standing at the window of a restaurant, watching the television inside. It felt so far away. I felt far away. But I knew how monumental the moment was because I could see how much it meant to my dad. He was with me in New York. He usually visits that time of year for my birthday. We spent that winter together in protest. Khalid Saeed was killed by police. Shaimet al Sabah was shot in the back. Crushed to death on marble steps. She was carrying a wreath of roses. In Sidi Gaber. In Cairo. He was a musician. She was a poet. He was hopeful. She was a mother. But his passion posed a threat. The people saw it happen. On the steps of a cafe. Bullets among roses. Face broken. They placed her in a plastic chair and there she bled to death. How strong are the factions working to undermine the opposition? Are they fundamentalists? What is the future of democracy in Egypt? Any thoughts on Libya? Yeah. What do the people want? I, I've always wanted to be Egyptian enough to explain Egypt. As the daughter of my Egyptian father, I felt it was my responsibility, but I didn't grow up with my dad. He moved abroad for work when I was a kid, and though I wanted to be close to him and his side of the world, I've never known Egypt as an Egyptian. Dad, what does the future look like for Egypt? What is ISIS really? What, wasn't Gittu part of the Brotherhood? Is this why you never want to go back? My father was the first of his family to emigrate. He left Egypt for New York where he met my mom, a white American woman. They met at a bodega. Dad was bagging groceries and my mother was finishing up her doctorate degree. Her parents were confused. <laughs> and concerned, they'd read not without my daughter, but my parents married anyway. Then dad went back to school, got a master's degree, and eventually a job with the United Nations. And he became his family's success story. My father's siblings were educated as well, but higher education didn't change their lives in the way it did for my dad. He had gone to school in the West, they had gone to school in Egypt, and when they graduated, they couldn't find work. There was no work. Two of my dad's siblings, my Aunt Hedia and my Uncle Abbas, came to the United States about 15 years after my dad. The rest went to neighboring Arab countries, wherever they could. Only my Aunt Nisa stayed. She studied accounting and worked in taxation. As a kid, I spent my summers in Egypt with my Aunt Nisa, her husband, and her two daughters, Dina and Mona. Aunt Nisa was my favorite aunt. She was my father's older sister, the savant of the family. She was strong and hardworking, and she'd raised her daughters to be the same. I loved her, and I loved my cousins. They lived on the fourth floor of a modest apartment in Alexandria, in a middle-class neighborhood where being middle-class meant stability without having much. I think of her street like most streets in Iskandria, dusty. Dust covers everything in that city. The ground is a thick layer of beige. Everything from the cars to the shop windows wears that emblem of the desert. Her street was no different. And when I think about it, there was really nothing externally charming about that street. It was just yellow cemented buildings, balconies, and hanging clothes. And sometimes when I visited, I'd pass dead pups from the stray dogs outside, their bodies bloating in the heat. And I think of how bizarre it was that my Aunt Nisa's home was my sanctuary. But it was sanctuary. Thank you, Aya, for that work. It makes us want to see the rest of the show. I can't wait till we have the opportunity to. <laughs> oh, I think you might be muted again. Hey, that. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Hey. <laughs> right. yeah, it's, uh, it would be such a joy to be in community with that cast and Arpita as, you know, director, really creative developer of the show with me. And um, I just, I, it would be an honor. We are so excited. <laughs> and, and so it shall be when we are able to get again <laughs> in Hawaii for, uh, for the next uh, Katza Confest. Um, so when I was thinking about how to 
uh, frame this uh, this episode. It was really informed by um, your work and Anita's work that we'll see in a minute. And so mm -hmm. I wonder about, I, I have to tell you one of the things that I really love about that video excerpt is the transition into the 21st century from the, because um, also growing up Arab American in the United States, uh, our, our heads were filled with all these uh, fantastical ideas about our homelands uh, that often are not at all related to our actual cultural experience or family experience, right? And um, so I just wonder, uh, you know, how this um, theme of um, cultural return through our artistic work resonates with you and, and how you think about that when you're creating work. Mm. It's such a good question and, and thank you for posing it. Um, I definitely wanted to explore the, the feeling of logging, something that is very present for me as, as an only child who kind of grew up with trying to grasp onto whatever fantasy place, you know, that could take her to, um, like, I mean, that could take me to my dad's world. You know, my dad was this kind of hero in the distance that I was so hungry to know. I, I was so proud to be Egyptian. Um, and then I, I, I had completely fell in love with a world that was so different from what I had grown up <laughs> understanding. Um, and I should, I meant to say before in the preface, that opening number was heavily influenced by Aladdin, which was my, you know, um, Although I never really loved Aladdin as a kid, and it was probably because I was confused because I didn't see my father or his <laughs> his essence or values in it, but that was home. Um, and so this it is this, it is very confusing. <laughs> very confusing right? um, but yeah, I wanted to explore this feeling of of longing for a world, um, a place, a memory as it's disappearing, um, as it's changing. Uh, certainly in my life, um, kind of losing so much of uh, uh, the Middle East, the Arab world, um, really before I could get the chance to explore it. Um, because I grew up in, in you know, uh, just a con an era of continuous war um, and kind of learning of these places from my father's childhood or my, my father's life that meant so much to him that were then being lost, whether in Damascus or, um, you know, I, I mean, when I think of longing for a world you can't return to, you know, I, I think of Palestinians and Palestine, I think of Yemenis, I think of Syrians, Iraqis, you know, um, uh, and uh, I've seen, I've seen how this longing, um, one, shaped me in my childhood, um, but also as it shaped the, the people in my family I care about, whether that's a longing for um, an Egypt they can't return to because they're in debt, you know, they come and, and in pursuit of American dream because the economy is um, so awful um, in, Mus uh, in Egypt uh, and, and then kind of get sucked into the supply chains of, um, you know, uh, that, that prey on immigrant people, migrant people and migrant workers. Um, or, uh, you know, longing for the U.S. after being, you know, forced out of uh, the United States and having that longing for um, a home that you can't return to because you, you know, uh, which is a story that that I explore in um, in Eda, uh, having having family members who were people who grew up in the U.S. who who understood themselves as. Um, you know, Egyptian and American, and suddenly had to experience um, a whole new uh, nation and find themselves in, in Egypt uh, as teenagers because they couldn't return home. And so, uh, that answers your question. That was a huge <laughs> roundabout way. Of no, uh, thank you for that. It it, it it's definitely a, a theme that I. Um, Plays well. Plays through the artistic work of many, um, as you said, many immigrant and migrant communities, and um, second and third generation artists in the United States, uh, and certainly in our communities. Um, so uh, I know that you uh, can't stay with us for the full episode tonight, but I'm so glad we got to meet you and see some of your work. Is there any uh, final words that you'd like to leave us with before? Um, before you have to go. And we can't wait to spend more time with you at the Confest when it happens. Oh, I, I just wish I, I, wish I could, could stay. I'm so um, 
excited to hear the voices of the other incredible artists of, the, of this panel um, and just engage the work. So I'll stay until eight in the background um, and then. <laughs> <laughs> And, then and we'll we'll also get to talk much more about your piece because we'll be talking with your director Arkita in the um, oh, in the okay. portion of the conversation. Yeah, that is also what I want to. say. It is strange talking about the show um, on on this in this box alone because um, there would be no show without Arpita. We really developed the show together, and so I'm very excited uh, that she's here and is going to participate in this panel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aya. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> yeah. um, so now we're going to take a, a look at a second work um, called The Red Shador, which has had many iterations. It's by um, performance artist Adayu Ali, um, who couldn't be with us tonight, but I do want to uh, read to you some um, contextual, contextualization in her own words about this project. And uh, it is a site-specific piece, and then we're going to see um, a video in which we'll hear her talk about her work uh, as well. The Red Shador, um, the, the iteration that was proposed for uh, the contest in Hawaii is Genesis One. It is envisioned as a participatory durational performance that examines the intersections of native and refugee states of being in Hawaii while performers are fully covered in a quote unquote Muslim headdress. In this ongoing series that continues the artist's thematic interest in using religious aesthetics to provoke ideas of otherness, performance artist Anita Yuali is accompanied by six other participants, each dressed in a unique sequin shador garment to engage the meaning of Muslim refugee status with respect to protocol in the kingdom of Hawaii. Um, so for today's episode, we will screen a, uh, an earlier iteration of the Red Shador that was previously filmed in Hawaii while Anita was in residence at Shangri-La, a center of the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. And this um, provocative work will certainly inform our conversations later in the episode. Uh, so let's see the video. Everyday folks should have the experience of contemporary art. You know, one of the first thing we thought was Chador fully closed to a point it's overclothed in this weather. The Waikiki Beach, barely dressed, you know, bikini clads or, or surfers. So put them in juxtaposition, it's a winner. It's a loaded image. How do you get them to do that double take, right, on an image or a video so that you can pull them into conversation? Because that's what's important is actually having that dialogue. My name is Anida Yu Ali, and I'm a performance artist. And I'm Masahiro Sugano, filmmaker, and the other half of Studio Revolt. The original Red Chador project began in 2015. It was a response to the Charlie Hebdo massacres and the burqa ban that was happening in France. Thinking about whether or not to rebirth her, I really felt she had to come back to life in an epic way. And that meant that she wasn't gonna be alone. So thus the multiple bodies. And in doing the research, we stumbled upon the idea of the rainbow and its huge significance here on this island as a, a pathway for celestial bodies to reappear. And then secondly, Hawaii legislatively has really pushed up against the Muslim ban when it was first introduced by the Trump regime. And so it felt like, you know, Shangri-La, the Islamic Museum, was the appropriate rebirth place for this. There were two photographic images that we were trying to execute at Shangri-La, and that is really our sort of leave behind commentary. One is, what does it mean to collect objects? But in this case, the flip of it is you're collecting the entire chadors with the human beings inside them. We always challenge the idea of art in that like elite space. Uh, you know, how do we break the barrier? How do we make it less class divided? Then the final shot of the day in a back alley with a DJ and uh, break dancers. 
It's really a celebration of the Chadors being part of a global hip hop culture. I know that hip hop and the urban arts is a really big deal here within Hawaiian youth subculture. And so it was a moment to have that alignment um, in this end to the entire residency and production. So that was a little bit of uh, background and context and some images from the Red Shador, which is intended to be performed as a site-specific migratory piece uh, when we are together in Hawaii. And it, this uh, work for me inspired this idea of nomadic Im imagination. Um, and what does that uh, mean? How does it uh, manifest in contemporary art and um, you know these questions that it brings up about representation hyper hyper visibility as well as invisibility and um, how one uh, belongs or doesn't belong um, in a, in an environment in which there are indigenous communities and uh, tourist communities and uh, people who have lived there for generations who are not indigenous and new migrant communities that are arriving all the time. And um, so uh, although Anita can't be with us uh, in the conversation, she is with us in spirit and we wanted to share her work to uh, be part of this conversation um, that we're having this evening. But before we go to our panels, panelists, we have a very, very special message from Jamil Corey who is the Artistic Director of Silk Road Rising in Chicago, and also a Kata board member. And he isn't with us tonight because he is at an award ceremony, and we wish him all the best this evening at the awards. Uh, and he sent us um, much, much more to think about and reflect on a quite um, wonderful, witty, and uh, provocative framing statement. So we'll hear Jamil's uh, video statement and, and then we'll uh, move to our conversation with the panelists. Let's see the video. Hello, my name is Jamil Corey and I am the co-founder and co-executive artistic director of Silk Road Rising. It is an honor to be included in this evening's program, Nomadic Imagination, Transnational Homelands and Cultural Return. In the assimilationist language so often ascribed to immigrant experiences, words like heritage and origin often imply past tense, that which was left behind. Yet for so many of us, nothing could be further from the truth. Heritage exists in past, present, and future tenses simultaneously. Our art making is inherently transnational, which is why we as artists find ourselves disrupting these increasingly false binaries of diaspora and homeland. Exile and rootedness are not mutually exclusive. Here and there fail to convey our psychic, spiritual, and sometimes physical experiences of community and belonging. I am the American-born son of a Syrian immigrant father. I have struggled with the occasional paradox of sometimes feeling more attached to people and events in Syria than to people and events a mile from my home in Chicago. And I say that as a proud, civically-minded Chicagoan. I want us to think about what it means to speak of homelands in the plural sense, what it means to think of homelands as fluid and flexible. If home is where the heart is, then the heart is motionary. It is geographically polyamorous. We are transnational because our identities, our stories, and our affinities traverse and transcend the legal boundaries of any one nation state. Our imaginations are nomadic because they wander, they explore, they find sustenance and power in places and cultures and languages that compel us to create. 
Our imaginations are nomadic because they honor cultural integrity while challenging tribalism and nationalism. Our imaginations are nomadic because they allow us to leave and return with shifting points of departure and arrival. Remember, where are you from and where are you right now are multiple choice questions that allow for multiple answers. And on that note, thank you for helping the world heal. Thank you so much, Jamil. Uh, Corey, I meant to mention he's not only a Kata board member, he is also a founding steering committee of Manatma, the Middle Eastern uh, North African Theater Makers Alliance. Um, and I particularly love this idea of being geographically polyamorous. Uh, I'm so excited that I have that new term in my life now. <laughs> so, Thank you, Jamil. And now it is so exciting to welcome all these amazing panelists. And I understand that Aya is going to stay with us a little bit longer. Um, I'll just say very briefly about all of these wonderful artists. I'm excited to be meeting Aya and Arpita tonight for the very first time in person. And uh, I would like to also say a few words about Heather Raffo, uh, who is an artist whose work has influenced me for a very, very long time, since 2003, when I first saw her perform Nine Parts of Desire in New York City. And uh, I'm, I'm honored to uh, be able to call a colleague and a friend because I continue to be inspired by Heather's extraordinary work. And also Khalid Sawaf, who is a theater director and who I know from uh, being uh, together in the National Institute for Directing and Ensemble Creation, uh, who is from Syria and currently lives in the United States. So welcome to all of you. Um, I'd love for everyone to just take a moment and say hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, hi everyone. Hello, hello. So welcome to meet you all. I'm very excited for you all to get to meet each other and to just, and I, I'm, I'm, I thank you for your willingness to just dive into the conversation. Um, and so um, I wanted to begin by asking about um, kind of initial thoughts or responses to the artistic works, the excerpts and images that we saw in relation to the themes of tonight around um, nomadic imagination, uh, homeland and cultural return. Uh, and also Jamil's statement, which had so many juicy, wonderful things to respond to in it. <laughs> um, so I want us to be very uh, conversational and um, to share, you know, whatever's on your mind. And I do have some prompt questions, but we can really go with wherever the juice is in the conversation. So um, would anyone like anyone I will say uh, that we haven't heard from yet like to begin? Oh, see, now we're all being shy. <laughs> um, I think I would like to begin with Heather or Kalud because, um, because Arvita is one of the art makers and knows that work very well. And I think you two might be encountering uh, both Ada and the Red Shore for the first time tonight. Um, so would either of you like to begin about um, how, the, how these themes either play a role in, in your work or what's resonating with you from the work that we saw this evening? Yeah, well, I'll, I mean, I'll start through something out there that I thought was, I thought it's so interesting that um, both, both works had took something that an audience would know very well as in a Shador or Aladdin and then completely repurposed it or redefined it or began to use it in their own way. And I think that that is, something that I've seen across theme in lots of work. And I find it really interesting. And I think it's interesting for many reasons, both because the artists themselves are trying to break with stereotype or repurpose stereotype, but also because sometimes even when you don't use anything of the sort, the audience brings it in with them 
That's right. No matter what you yeah. do. So then you're sitting there as the artist having not even alluded to or referenced, and then they start to put it on your work no matter what. So I think, I just think it's a really, I think you, you could see in just two examples, you know, only two ways people are trying to, to deal kind of with the audience they have or the audience, they, they know what the questions are gonna be. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for that, Heather. That's it. That uh, definitely is an experience. I saw a lot of um, snapping and head shaking that I think we've all had. <laughs> Halud, did you have some thoughts you'd like to share? Yes. First of all, I wanted to say how inspiring it is to be in this space with everyone uh, here. Thank you so much for this invite. And I absolutely agree with what Heather beautifully put uh, and the element of I also agree with, with, with what you, Andrea, mentioned about the, the moment of uh, in that uh, Ada, a question from my father, uh, the moment of taking off, you know, starting with a specific image and then taking that off on stage and metaphorically and physically was such a powerful moment and such a powerful of like, okay, come, come here with me to the to the stereotype, I'm coming with you, let's go, let's go, let's go. And then I'm going to tear that stereotype away for you. Uh, and that's really beautifully done and uh, is something that I'm sure each person who's done work has navigated that question and thought about it and is alive with that. How do we, you know, the expectations and the stereotypes and the work that is put on, on uh, uh, an identity or a religion or a country or a geography or a what or a language as soon as you place it in a piece of work and how do you navigate that path um, and what's the do you tear it apart gently do you tear it apart not gently I'm excited to be in presence with all of those options thank you Thank you so much for that. Um, Arfitza, we haven't uh, gotten to hear from you yet, and you're the director of ADA Questions for my father, uh, and we were all just talking about that scene and that transition. Um, what was on your mind about seeing the other pieces and your own artistic process and the, the kind of uh, provocations that Jamil raised in his statement? Um, thank you so much for having me here. It's so inspiring to be here with uh, everyone today, these wonderful artists whose work I love and that inspires me. Um, yeah, I think that um, it's it's so interesting to see um, both th both of the both of these works with each other. Uh, and mm -hmm. I'm really excited about that um, that conversation because I think um, something we were really deliberate about is that, uh, we did want to bring the audience into this play. We did want, and, and we wanted to confront even Aya's discomfort of telling the story to this audience, uh, which is yeah. uh, sort of how I think we are working and thinking all the time. And we put that a vulnerability of who am I to tell the story uh, sort of like upfront, uh, and and uh, and and I think because of the and there's something sort of like a dis confrontation and then disarming confrontation and then disarming, which is that there is this confrontation of and because even at talkbacks people would tell us that they were so into the play at that moment when the when the uh, Vista change happens. And uh, what I noticed in Anita's work as well is that there's this, there's this, I'm so intrigued by this, I'm disarmed by it. And it is also confronting me mm -hmm. that I feel like that tension of uh, is so interesting because it's, it wasn't that after that uh, moment of of the change, it's then Aya coming on and being like, I don't know how to tell the story. So you, you're sort of in, in terms of what Kolud's talking about, in terms of that gently, you know, you're sort of uh, manipulating is probably the wrong word, but crafting this relationship with the audience so that 
you can make these gestures and that we that was very sort of I, I would sit in the audience and watch the story unfold sometimes so to kind of make them part of the question uh was was important to us um and i felt that in anita's work so much you know mm -hmm. that tension as well yeah thank you for making that connection that's uh, that's really wonderful one of the things that i'm often uh, well, that I'm curious about, and then I'll turn to Aya before she has to go, is that, um, I, you know, do we, th this, uh, the, the kind of development of a, um, it, it takes different forms, whether we say Mina or Manasa or uh, Middle Eastern American, and, and whether that includes South Asia or doesn't, there's all the, and whether it includes North Africa or doesn't, in the framework of Asian America, right? The, we, we live in these very um, uh, fluid and overlapping and sometimes crashing into each other identity um, spaces, right? That we're constantly navigating. Um, and yet I wonder in the last 20 years, if there has been something evolving that we could call um, a shared aesthetic or themes that are connected or that continually come up in our work um, and perhaps it is around um, this relationship to homelands and cultural return and memory and loss and looking and uh, imagining new futures. I'm not. I'm not really sure, but I don't know. What do you? What do you think about those connections and seeing in arising in your own work and in the work that you see of other artists in our communities, in our rather overlapping communities? Um, I, I'll, I'll toss it over to you unless somebody else wants to jump in. Um, in many ways, I see a lot of cla uh, class similarities or experience. I think, you know, and Arpita and I would talk about this kind of, uh, and I don't want to speak for you, Arpita, but this idea of having a, belonging to um, a generation of our parents who perhaps didn't have the opportunity or, or freedom to dream and be whoever they wanted to be um, in the same way that uh, our generation, or at least my generation, um, has had uh, the ability to. Um, and I think that, so, so kind of, a, I see shared experiences in diaspora um, and a kind of reckoning uh, across artists of our generation of a home that they feel distanced from because of, um, and, and a home they feel distanced from, you know, not only geographically and culturally, but also in containing the dissonance between kind of a, a life of privilege and, and material things and also a life of possibility and a home that is so disenfranchised. And so um, uh, I think, you know, there, so disenfranchised and so um, in ways that that I I don't want to feel hmm, being, I'm, I'm not being my most eloquent in this, but something that really struck me, let's say, is when a friend of mine um, went to visit her family in, in Pakistan and was um, kind of blown away by the air pollution, you know, no pun intended, but um, was struck by by lack of access to healthcare, lack of um, mobility, uh, struck by what it meant for her family to be middle class in Pakistan versus, you know, her her life in the United States. And this is not somebody of a um, of a upper class background. This is also someone of a working class background of um, first generation origin. But the dissonance between kind of the life in the United States and diaspora um, and life. Uh, back in, in home countries and the countries of our parents and kind of containing that knowledge of um, the, the world and kind of a, speaking to a global system of, um, of, of class subjugation. Um, and I think that's what I think of when I, when I look at, um, when, I, when I see kind of similarities in belonging and also kind of a confusion of belonging um, and a kind of reckoning between what we know is home and what home is here and why these things are so different and how fairness plays um, and across both spaces. 
So. Yeah, this is a really interesting um, class definitely complicates and uh, the the conversation about um, experiences in in our communities right um, and and it also I think then the, the the kind of class references we have both in the United States and globally then also influence who we might align ourselves with here in the United States mm -hmm. like um, you know the 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 perhaps more, similarities among migrant workers regardless of homeland home country than there are bet between yeah. classes in our own cultural group perhaps you know what i mean and um so that's a really interesting conversation that we don't often have <laughs> the intersection of class and uh and cultural identity that um is a, is a difficult one to have in the united states certainly because class i think often remains a taboo um, conversation that uh, we, we're not always having in an intersectional way when we try to talk about recent culture. Um, so I thank you for bringing that up. It's it's very um, interesting to me. D does anybody else in the panel want to um, respond to that before I ask another question? I know it's a really complex and provocative topic. I mean, I'll respond to the question because I, but I, I'm not sure. I think I understood it differently. You're asking kind of in the Manasa theater, uh, what are the themes or the movements that we've been seeing? Is that is that correct? Yeah. So I'll just say that that I, my my perspective is is take is really stepping back and taking that in in context of two decades or two decades and a half of work. And I think that um, as we saw tonight as well, this this um, theme of translation has always been very present. As in, do we need to, are the, are the artists themselves trying to translate something for this audience, yeah. right? Or translate something for, on, on behalf of, our homeland, um, and I think for for a long time the real struggle within the community, no matter what we were writing or whatever our personal stakes in wanting to be a translator or not, we were really searching for um, the kind of the ability to be proved valid. We weren't we didn't need validation for our work per se; it was just the right to be produced. And so that validity itself just took so long. It just took decades, right? And so mm -hmm. even though now one can say there is, there is more of that, there was still a gatekeeper, right? And, and the gatekeeper could exist even outside the American theater. Like it could still exist in a theater of color, <laughs> right? That you had to, you, what I'm trying to say is that the, the producerial element of the art that demanded that the audience be translated for was just a whole process that I've watched grow over decades, but not necessarily change over decades. So if you ask about me as just an artist and what I might want to do or say, you know, one can you can grow and you can say, I don't want to say any of that stuff. I just want to say what I want to say, right? But there's there's all these kind of walls in front of you. So, so to say there are commonalities, yes. What I think is probably the most interesting of all is the moment we're in right now. Because for me, the moment we're in right now negates the very idea that the audience is American or possibly even white or possibly in need of translation at all, ever. Because 
the audience in my house right now, let's say, could be my mom who doesn't go to the theater ever walking past me, right? <laughs> or could be anyone anywhere in the world. So like, it's we're suddenly in a very different moment of who we do it for and what the conversation is around it. And, and I think that that is so exciting. And even though the American theater is changing epically right now, <laughs> I think we're also going to take this back into it, and that will forever um, change how Manasa theater artists even need to approach their producers, let alone approach the art they want to make. Hmm. Thank you for that. I know we're going to have to let Aya go while we continue the conversation. I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you. Uh, Aya, any final words before you have to Leave us. Uh, Heather, that was so well said. Thank God you responded to that question. <laughs> no, um, but yeah. I'm too old to not respond to that question <laughs> after all the decades in the business. Oh, it's been such a joy um, being in community with all of you and your brilliant minds. And thank you for having me here. Thank you for joining us. More of your work. <laughs> Yes, we look forward to staying connected. See you. Bye. So um, that is actually kind of where my next question was going uh, about the moment that we're in now. Um, Heather and I have actually had these conversations about um, how for us, the two of us, in some ways, the post 9-11 era from 2001 to now has, and, and, the, and the aftermath of 9-11, the ongoing wars have impacted and in some ways formed our work as artists and so in such deep and ongoing ways. And then suddenly, uh, while that hasn't ended, there are these new waves of uh, political realities to respond to. Like I know that Khalud has life and work has been personally and deeply impacted by the travel ban of the Trump administration, the Muslim ban. And, and, and suddenly we're in COVID in this new era where we're trying to reimagine theater itself and our lives and what safety and human connection means. And, and we're still kind of processing like wave after wave of these historical moments that are in that deeply affect uh, our lives and work and and who we are as artists. And so that's kind of my my question. Do you feel a shift happening? Like Heather just talked about the shift she feels happening. Do we feel like we're entering a new era? And um, if we are, what is it that you feel like we're entering politically or aesthetically? Um, Arvita or Khalud want to, to respond to that or anything that was said previously? I don't know that I'm qualified to say if we're entering an era or not. You know, I'm very much present in the moment and and trying to. <laughs> it's a good to start. You know, it's good to have like a jumping off point where there is not a law that bans you from existing. So that's a good jumping off point. Let's say, uh, <laughs> but I I don't know yet how does that affect the work because i i think it's it will take time for us to discover uh what that means i certainly agree with heather that it's a very exciting moment to remove uh limitations in terms of access to working with each other and suddenly the world is your oyster to collaborate with whoever Whoever can collaborate with whoever, as long as you have access to internet and uh, uh, technology, which I of course acknowledge that not everybody does have that privilege. Uh, but that that's a, such an exciting moment to imagine, what does that mean aesthetically? What does that mean linguistically? What does that mean uh, uh, in terms of who we are doing this work for? Suddenly, if I'm doing a piece such as 10,000 Balconies, I want to make sure my home, my family in Damascus can actually know what I'm saying. So I can't do it mostly in English. I have to make sure it, it has more Arabic in it. And then we'll figure out how do we 
you know, where do I dance between the cultural translation, how beautifully uh, said also by Heather. So I think it's such an exciting moment in terms of uh, aesthetics and also be exposed to other work, how beautiful it is to be here and be able to witness a piece uh, by a company in, in the UK that I really, you know, I'm watching their work, how beautiful it is to be able to be here and witness work in Lebanon. Uh, and I think because of this moment, we are able to imagine that. It, we've had it all along, but for some reason, now we're actually doing it. And it's really exciting to do that. Um, but I don't know what that means yet moving forward. I really do hope we, as we spin the new plates, we don't like leave, you know, like as we're able to move forward past this moment, we're not like, okay, now I want the past back because we can't do like, now that we have had this access, it's really beautiful to hold on to it. And it's really inspiring. And I really hope we all aspire to do that. Yeah, I definitely think there are some shifts that are, um, are deep enough that they're not going to go back to exactly how our theater experience was before. And certainly our our audiences and, and our communities now have a different expectation of us than they did before. And I don't think they're going to want to let go of it. <laughs> and so we have to figure out how we re-enter the live and also uh, keep and expand the access of this virtual world that we're living in for the time being. Um, Arpita, how do you envision this impacting your work or how you're thinking about theater now? Yeah, it's so, um, I feel like because of the moment we're in and I'm going speaking more specifically about the pandemic and not being able to make, uh, be in a space together, I think really forces us to ask, what is theater? You know, what does it mean to make theater? Um, and it, it has really made me, and I was sort of questioning this in my practice for, for a little bit, but the pandemic, what makes it not television and film and, you know, really sort of, and now with more and more playwrights and sort of theater makers going to film and television, uh, I think it really forces us to sort of like reckon with what is theater? What do I want out of an experience I know that I've always said that there are financial barriers, but there are also incredible cultural barriers to the way we we go to the theater, which uh, you know uh, actually contribute to probably some d decline in going to. The, what do we love to go to? What's the first thing we're going to go to when uh, when we can gather? It's going to be probably spaces of joy, of community where we can just be, we don't have to turn our phones off and be quiet and sit in the dark. And you know, so I'm just, uh, I'm really sort of like thinking about what, and trying to expand actually the definition of theater. And it kind of also speaks to at, at Hypocrite uh, specifically and thinking of theater as live event rather than a well-made play. Um, and it's it sort of, came out of because most of our audiences don't read the New York Times. They don't, you know, they're not theater, like regular, always going to the theater. Hypocrite is their theater home. And when we ask them questions, they we get the most, if you listen to audiences, you know, they're like, what is a reading? Or <laughs> they ask questions that I think in, industry has sort of imbibed in us. And I, and I think, if we want more sort of work to happen and the industry to thrive, we have to sort of think about producing models um, and think about what is it. And I think it's it's really showing up on, on Zoom and the online platforms of incredible live event, live theater that is being made because that is our skill. It is to, to have you experience something and feel engaged in it in that moment. And um, so that th that's something, you know, that I am is sort of really thinking about of like, do we wanna, how we want to think about what makes this theater? Ask that question to everything we make uh, because there's a lot of experiences people can have passively sitting at home on Netflix or any other platform. So I think that I'm questioning the form and theater as a way to also create more space for 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 artists, cool. so yeah. 
Um, and speaking of space, I know, Khalud, you've been doing work with curbside theater and trying to reimagine how you use space to, to still be able to make live work that people can see. Do you want to talk a little bit about those experiments? Sure, thank you. Uh, it's actually an idea that was born out of the pandemic and uh, the idea was created by a friend and collaborator. Her name is Laura Shatkis and she's the artistic director of a small theater company here in Fayetteville called Arkansas Staged. And it really was coming from the place of like, how do we, how do, we do it as opposed to we do it? Uh, and we started gathering a small group of artists, uh, started gathering over Zoom, and we were devising a new piece uh, using moment work technique. And then once we started wanting to rehearse it in a physically shared space, that's when we we were really going about how do we do it safely and we're creating uh, audience agreement to make sure this is safe for them, uh, artist agreement, COVID artist agreement, uh, and making sure like what's the way of reporting to each other if, you have, if you're exposed, what's the way to, how do we handle props, how do we handle, and we had part of the creation, we had a, a character who's like a clown who's obsessed with cleanliness, so that helped us a lot because it was like she was cleaning everything, <laughs> so that was really just handy. Uh, Yes, and it was really exciting to be able to take that piece into different uh, backyards, front yards, in front of um, nursing home facilities, uh, and and so forth, so on and so forth. And the weather was was hot, but it was doable during. It was just on time to do it, and it was like a thirty-five minutes show that was community funded and, and was offered for the community for free. Thank you so much for sharing that. I want to uh, go back to something that Heather said earlier about, um, well, and, and also that we've all been talking about, about how now um, it's almost like we don't just have to have these transnational homelands that are far away and that we cannot reach, but that we that actually can zoom in <laughs> and actually like be with us and be in the experience of the work that we're making. So. Uh, like um, I directed a reading uh, with some former cast members of a uh, production of Nine Parts of Desire and Heather joined us and the cast members who were uh, university students uh, at the University of South Florida the first time that they did the production uh, now are young adults and uh, emerging artists all over the world. Um, one was actually in Japan during the reading and uh, one uh, of the actresses is from Nigeria and her family who had never gone to see, you know, what we call theater in a theater in Nigeria ever before, were able to tune in, even though it was, I think, three or four o'clock in the morning for them. <laughs> they, there was a Nigerian audience for Nine Parts of Desire that was happening online uh, as, a, as a reading uh, here in the United States, and that it was such a wonderfully, beautifully rich experience to know that our notion of audience has completely changed. And um, so, Heather, I wanted to ask you if you wanted to say anything about that experience and where is it taking you when you think about future work or what you want to do to create next as a as a playwright or as a performer. Well, I, I mean, the, it, it completely changes, as you said, the notion of what is audience, but it also, at least, it takes away the ticket price, too, which having had to be a theater maker in New York for a good couple decades, um, you know, if I live somewhere else, which I'd quite like to do, um, I might have a, a new perspective, but it's it, I can't afford to go to the theater in my hometown. I can't go see my friends in plays because I can't. Who, who can afford it? Right. So now we're now we're not only saying that like <laughs> the the theater is affordable, but it's uh, you know it's international. And I know that artists need to be paid, including myself, you know, like sustainability is 
is key <laughs> to all our lives. But I do think the notion of what is an what is an audience and and how are they engaged and what are they even writing in the Zoom chat could be really will be taken forth into the theater forevermore because nobody wants to go back to a lot of other things at the same moment that we do want to go back to the magic of being in a live shared space versus this other live space. And I agree with you Arbita, entirely. I love theater as a live event. And, um, the play I'm working on is a, is a pretty huge epic about migration in the global economy. And it takes place in scenes around the world. And when I started writing it and had written for a year, I thought, oh, this is just an unproducible play. Why do I keep writing this? <laughs> it will never, it could never get produced. I mean, there, it doesn't even, each scene doesn't even connect to the other. It's, it literally just bops around the world. And, it, and none of it started to make sense as anything actually doable until the idea of doing it virtually. And now it's just clear that, you know, the scene that is in Nigeria and Norway and El Paso can be, can either take place in all those places or like the, the, the theater itself will migrate for this piece. Um, and that's, that's been very fun to explore. That's incredible. I feel similarly that when the, when, sort of it was presented in the beginning, okay, we're gonna do things on Zoom. I was like, no, I do not want to do things on Zoom. And then it was sort of the project we, I was developing that were the most unproducible in the sense we thought, oh, this is gonna take a long time. We're never gonna do it because this is about food and Bollywood and you know, it's how are we gonna do it with people? It's like, that's the first one we're doing. And then the second one we're doing is a video game that, you know, so it's it's sort of, it, it kind of took away a lot of the barriers that, and then it made me think that the barrier wasn't so much even the, it needing to be live, it was the barrier is often the building. I mean, most of the ticket price is going towards sustaining a building, not artists, not creative uh, thought, but just, a building that has existed for several, and you know, and we're still building more buildings uh, and creating more barriers for people to get to those buildings and then complaining that we don't have audiences. It's like quite, you know, and then it's like, you take the building away, you forget about the building. You just take the play where it wants to go. And it's totally different. And I totally agree. I don't think we can go back to uh, now come into this building because now the building represents some scary things as well. Uh, you know, so uh, besides, it used to represent privilege. Actually, what a building represents is also changing. We want open air more than we want to be inside in a building. So uh, it's it's all going to, I just hope that it stays because uh, I don't know, sometimes I feel like I'm so hopeful about this change, uh, uh, but all I know is that I want to incorporate it into my artistic practice and the way we make work at Hypocrite. I just hope that that translates because it, once you're forced to innovate, you shouldn't go back. Nobody orders food anymore after Seamless the way they did. Like, let's just go with it. It's shifted, it's changed, you know? Uh, so that's something I've, yeah, been thinking about a lot, the, the unproducible play. In the very exciting... Go ahead, Kolu, go ahead. The very exciting thing about this moment is that Zoom account is equal to any theater in the country's Zoom account. We just have the same Zoom account because buildings are meaningless, so. Yeah, you can just do it. You've all um, quite organically shifted into what was going to be my my last question, which is, what are you most excited about right now? Um, this is such a moment. And honestly, when we were planning this session, I didn't know what kind of moment we would be in as a nation or, you know, what we would be, what feelings we would be bringing to the conversation. Uh, and, and there's still a lot of uncertainty ahead. Um, 
but the, it feels like there is space to have a breath and to be excited about future and to begin to plan. <laughs> and um, and so I'm wondering, like, uh, what are you most excited about? And I, I think I want to start with Hulud because I I'm also very very curious about this um, transmedia performance conversation that you've been a part of with other uh, artists around the country. And so I'm curious about what's popping up for you out of that and. And also just what you're looking forward to. Yeah, it's, I think it, this moment definitely, I come from a, a film background before I started doing theater. Uh, and I think this moment really put my older career and my most recent one in conversation uh, a lot. And I think having that conversation and thinking like, we think about film in a shot based, like the currency for film is shot, is the shot, and the currency for the theater is the scene. So when you're, when the scene and the shot are in conversation to come up with a three currency, with a three unit that we look at, that's really what I'm investigating and thinking about constantly. And I'm really excited about the moment where those two mediums mix in a third something that feels like, I, I don't know what that means yet. If, is it a really something virt, uh, uh, virtual present in the physical space that maybe they're having conversation with each other? Is it something else? I don't know, but all of those possibilities are really exciting. And uh, I'm thinking about it constantly and definitely the transmedia space that I've been doing and shout out to Claudia, uh, Alec, that we've been doing that conversation that we've been doing weekly is very informative and really wonderful just to be with artists in the space in a peer exchange conversation where artists are just really figuring it out constantly and finding new ways to produce and create and be uh, really wonderful and creative. Thank you. Thank you for that. Heather, what are you excited about or dreaming of as future work or just uh finding joy in? Well, I'm really excited about the first Asian American female vice president. Yeah, I just wanted to say at this, you know, this particular conference, we must mention that. Oh, yes. We I might mean, do more than mention it if we can. <laughs> we must mention it always, right? Like, so I'm very excited about that. Um, yeah. No, I'm, I, I think I've mentioned most of the things I'm excited about. Um, I'll say something, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that because of the, the title of this conference and the things that I'm reckoning with, having spent 20, 30 years kind of reckoning with my Iraqi father's birthplace of Mosul and homeland and, and elements of that in my writing. I know that that happened because when I was 20, there was the first war with Iraq. And there's been all, all these, um, let's say violences since that have related me to that. And so my, my constant pull to conversation has been because it's, felt those two cultures were incommensable, the American culture with the Iraqi culture, and that I was trying to investigate narrative that would upend both. But what's very, very interesting, having spent the last eight months in Michigan due to my father's passing and needing to take care of my mom, is I had to reckon with my true birthplace. Like, I wasn't born in Iraq. <laughs> I reckoned with my birthplace of Michigan. I reckoned with my hometown. I reckoned with like, so when I was conceived and the first four years of my life, we lived in this very tiny little duplex. And sure enough, I found myself living in a rental, like a five minute walk from this duplex for the first two months because I was quarantining from my mom who then I had to take move into her basement and take care of. So like my... Anyway, what I mean by all that is um, conversation for me right now that's hugely alive in my work is the conversation of the swing state. 
is the co is the other incrementable conversation mm -hmm. that I I'm also can get right in the middle of and navigate because of you know family on both sides and lots of people I know on both sides and just feeling like I'm this artist that wants to understand that narrative in a really complex way and I think that that is something the theater and the arts might might be a part of or be up for reckoning with I know as artists we tend to we 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 tend to have very strong opinions on our side and want to put them out and put them forth and I do and we all do and we we want that but I'm also very interested in where the actual conversation is and where it's difficult and how to write in that and with that I think we might need to we might need to get a Michigan, Florida uh, conversation going, Heather. <laughs> so Florida, we, we need some help down here, y'all. Wait, wait, wait. It's, it's, not, it's complicated. Huh? I said Arkansas. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Hello, Arkansas. Yeah. I leave her uh, out. <laughs> I think I'll be moving first. <laughs> Um, we are moving toward a close. Arkansas, do you want to uh, just tell us what you're excited about? Um, uh, yeah, I wanted to just point out that my home state is Virginia, which had its moment in 2008 and 12, and then moved on from being the swing state, so nobody comes here anymore. Um, so I have a lot of questions about the electoral college and and the, and democracy. Um, yeah, I think I'm really excited about these conversations uh, I'm excited uh, I am consistently inspired by what all other theater artists are doing especially BIPOC artists um, and I was making a joke to someone that we're going to be fine because nobody produced our stuff before anyway <laughs> so <laughs> we're just going to figure it out we're just going to go do it uh, because we've been having to do that um, so I'm, I'm excited about um, having more opportunities to collaborate and taking this breath and and talking to people and and I feel like I'm in a great uh, school of of learning how creative and and how innovative uh, artists can be so I, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing all the work that we're talking about today Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us tonight and being part of the, what a wonderful conversation. I feel excited just to have been a part of it and to get to hear what you're all thinking. And thank you for sharing it with a wider audience. Um, you can see the whole episode on HowlRound and share it there or Facebook Live. Uh, I, I wanna give a shout out to uh, not only Kata, but also Manatma. And you can learn more about Manatma by visiting minatheatermakers.org, uh, which I encourage you to do. It is a um, growing community and national network um, that uh, is it has a strong, deep relationship with Kata. And we're all um, glad for those continuing conversations. And thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Khalud. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Arpita. I can't wait till we can be together again in person and in more virtual spaces. Thank you, Andrew. So, um, yes. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, and so we're going to move toward our closing slides. Um, I want to give a shout out to Max, who is behind the scenes doing tech, and Ariel, who helped make this whole session happen. Please mark your calendars for our next episode in the Return to the Source Kata series, which will be Monday, December 14th. Um, from the source, Seeds for a Myriad of Worlds, hosted by Roger Tang of Pork Filled Players. And uh, we hope you will very much join us for that and the ongoing series into 2021. I'd like to thank our funders and supporters, um, giving mahalo, mahalo and a shout out and thanks uh, definitely to HowlRound for live streaming with us tonight and also to all the wonderful um, supporters in our field that you see on the screen, Teata Productions, 
um, the Doris Duke Charitable F Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, um, Ford Foundation, NIFA, the University of Hawaii and Manoa, who will be our host for the in-person confest when we're able to gather again, TCG, they, um, and all of the uh, supporters that you see on the screen. Thank you all for making tonight and this whole series possible. And we hope you will join us again in December. Um, good night, everyone. Thank you. Be well, stay safe, take care, and we hope to see you again soon. Good night.